Okay, next I'm going to describe how we make our particle image velocity symmetry measurements. These are the measurements that you uh, see the velocity fields for the uh, baseballs or golf balls and the, the red and blue colors. I'm going to explain how we do it and what, what these measurements mean. Um, before I do, let me just show you some eye candy. Here's some posters that we've made with some special baseballs. This one uh, belongs to a friend of mine, Doug Neal, and uh, that's signed by Sparky Anderson, Jack Morris, and Alan Trammell and a bunch of other Tigers from that era. Uh, this, this one my son owns, this is Fergie Jenkins. I signed that from a couple of years ago. Uh, this is uh, my friend Eric O'Flaherty, formerly of the Braves and the Seattle Mariners and, uh, and the Mets. And uh, this is the crew at Driveline that visited us a while back. Uh, Joe Marsh, uh, Eric Jaggers, Dean Jackson, and uh, Kyle Bodie uh, signed that baseball. And in each case, we do these measurements the same way. We first launch the ball with this cannon. The cannon is provided to us by uh, Washington State uh, University Sports Science Lab. They develop this and use it for a number of different things. Um, in the video you just saw, it's launching the ball without spin. The ball just sits on a tee and gets pushed forward uh, without spin. A lot of the data that I'm going to show you is done that way. Um, <clears throat> but uh, quite often, uh, we spin the ball like a, a normal baseball pitch. And in order to do that, we use this very clever uh, tip that uh, Jeff Kensra of Washington State calls a flex tip. It's, uh, to me, a, a bit like a human hand wrapped around the ball, um, but the human hand has pine tar on the top and Vaseline on the bottom. It's sticky here and it's slick on this side. And this tip squeezes the ball, and the deeper you put it into the tip, the, um, the more the ball has to rotate to come out. So when the cannon hits the end of its travel, the ball will slip out of this tip with spin. And in this particular uh, uh, setup, the spin would be about 12 o'clock, uh, like a fastball. And if I want to make it a, a curveball, all I do is rotate this tip 180 degrees so that the slick side's on top. So it's really nice that way that you can very easily change what kind of pitch you're throwing. You can prescribe how much RPM you get by how far you put this in here. You can change the speed by changing the pressure inside the cannon. It's a very, and it's an extremely repeatable uh, uh, way to deliver a baseball. And uh, another nice thing about it, compared to a wheeled machine that we've used in the past, it doesn't damage the balls very much. It, uh, at worst, might uh, um, discolor the leather from the tip. So we fire that, uh, we use that cannon to fire the ball into a, a small tent or, or box. Not small, it's rather large. Um, the ball moves through this box, and you'll see a video of it in a second. Uh, as the ball enters the box, it, it passes through a couple laser sensors. If, the, if it cuts both of them, we know the ball is where we want it to be and we know it's arriving. And that fires these two uh, laser pairs down here that illuminate the ball and some particles that we have in the air around it. The camera then takes pictures of the ball as it goes through. So this is what that looks like. Um, you'll see the ball come, this is the same video over and over again. See the ball enter the tent. Uh, you see it get, uh, strike those two red lasers. Uh, and then there's a small delay, and when it reaches the, the area near the camera, the two green lasers fire to light up the uh, the baseball and all the particles that are in the field. So this is raw PIV data of a baseball flying by. The ball's moving 90 miles an hour. It's not spinning. And the particles that you see there are theater fog, or uh, what you'd see at a disco. And um, they look much bigger in the picture than they are. These are very, very tiny particles. Uh, and, and you can see that we've taken two pictures of the ball as it goes by. Um, they're very close together, about 20 microseconds apart in time. And your eye can see that, uh, that the, the particles are moving around. If you look at the back of behind the ball in the wake, you can see them moving quite a lot. If you look far to the top or bottom edge, you see them not moving very much. If you look right here on the front of the ball, you can see they're just being pushed pretty much straight downstream. So we can pump that data into a computer and some magic happens and it will produce a field that looks like this. This is called vorticity, that which does not matter to you at all. Uh, like I said before, all I care about is where this wake forms and that's where the colors basically are. Uh, I wish I could present it this way most of the time, but the software that we have makes this a little difficult to do. Uh, most of the time the, the vorticity has a positive or negative sign, which makes it blue or red. But we also put arrows in here so that you can kind of see where everything's flowing. Um, again, all I care about is where this point is on the top and the bottom. In this case, for this baseball, uh, it's, it's symmetric and, um, and, and not, not much exciting is happening here. Okay, so that takes us uh, to now talking about seam-shifted wakes. Um, 
Bef yeah, before I get into describing some of the pitches that we're going to try to use this, I want to use these PIV measurements to show you what the seams do to the wake of the ball. So in this particular this particular baseball, again, these are not spinning. Um, it's moving straight to the left, 90 miles an hour. And it's, the separation locations on the top and the bottom of the ball are about the same. And there's no seams anywhere near those two separation locations. Uh, but if I rotate that ball a little bit to the right, now this seam, you can see, coincides with the separation location on that side. If I back up, you notice that the, on the bottom, not much is happening. That location is staying pretty much fixed because there's no seam there. But as that seam ro rolls further and further back, this separation point's moving with it, and you're starting to see that the wake is tilting downward a little bit. If I go too far, uh, the separation point snaps back to the, where it was before the seam was there. Okay, so now same thing with the four seam orientation. Uh, right now, nothing's happening. Uh, both of these separation points are the same, the top and the bottom of the ball. But if I rotate it a little bit, uh, now that separation, that, that, that side's separating right off of that seam. And if I go further, it's uh, more so. Uh, if I go too far, uh, the seam no longer has any effect. If it's, too, if it's on the front of the ball, it's not going to cause separation. But now this seam is causing the separation on that side. So I'm going to take that one step back. and Notice how this was deflected very strongly downward and a little bit more rotation. Now it's deflected upward. So a very big change between those. those I'm sorry, I, uh, <laughs> I did more than I wanted to do there. Let me try that again. OK, I go from here to here. Uh, so it's a subtle change in the uh, uh, position of the ball and a radical change in the wake. Um, okay, so if I continue to rotate further back, that seam that's on just on the rear of the ball up here on the top is going to continue to cause that separation point to move until it no longer has the ability to do that. Then it snaps back to here again. And the interesting thing about the the forcing orientation is that when one side lets go, the other one tends to pick up. So we've launched a lot of baseballs and try to get an idea of uh, generally what happens. And this is Andrew's map of, of seam effects. Generally what we find is that anywhere between 6 degrees in the front of the ball to about 18 degrees in the back of the ball, if you have a seam there, it will cause the, the, the flow to separate at that point in the wake to form. If there's no seam anywhere in that area, uh, you'll have a separation point that's about somewhere over the next 12 degrees. And it's the same thing on the bottom. Um, and uh, all of this is relative to what we call the hemisphere line. The hemisphere line is really a disk. I, I, I should call it a hemisphere disk. This is a, a plane that is perpendicular to the ball flight direction. And that's important. I'm going to show in a second that uh, sometimes if the ball changes direction, this line changes. But when we talk about this 6 degrees and 18 degrees and 12 degrees, I'm talking about relative to that slice through the ball. Uh, this is, a, again, for a ball that's not spinning. If we spin the ball, this whole picture, whoops, this whole picture will rotate a little bit. If I, if I put backspin on the ball, um, uh, the, top, uh, the, the stuff on the top would rotate this way, the stuff on the bottom would rotate that way a little bit. Okay, so uh, my... Um, PowerPoint's fit to be tied. It really wants to show you this awesome video of Ari Dickey. I got this uh, video from Alan Nathan from his website. Uh, one of the best videos of a knuckleball I've ever seen. And everybody loves knuckleballs. They're a lot of, uh, a lot of fun to, to watch. Um, you've probably been told at some point that this happens because the seams cause turbulent flow when on one side and laminar on the other. Um, I don't, that, that may be accurate to some extent, but I, I really believe that what's happening here is exactly what I've been showing you that the seams on the back of the ball on one side are causing to separate, whereas the other side doesn't have the same thing going on. That makes a force on the ball. Um, the ball rotates a little bit, and that force changes direction. And in this case, it's happening several times on the way to the plate. Uh, the ball's spinning slowly, so the effect's not getting canceled out by the ball spinning. So really, what the whole game is for us is to find a way to make that sort of thing happen in a stable way, in a kind of consistent way. So on the right, I've shown one of the PAV pictures that I've shown earlier. And on the left, I have a ball with a stick, and I'm spinning it on a drill. And you can see that I have a seam here that's in, most of the time, in a position like the this one here. And when I first made this, saw this picture, I thought, well, that's a seam shifted wake of, uh, of, a, of a pitch you could throw without realizing this gyro um, uh, angle here is 
one that a pitcher would not normally throw. Uh, typically, that would be tilted the other way. But nevertheless, if I could throw a ball that way, I could have this situation in a stable way. And uh, the, the whole game here is going to be about trying to imagine some orientations and axis of the ball that can cause the seam shifted effect to happen stably.